Channel, Britain's news channel. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on telly, radio and online. Today we'll be looking at the new Home Secretary, Suella Braverman's proposed blanket ban on channel migrants claiming asylum. The usual charities have claimed it's barbaric and unlawful. Also, I'll be shedding light on Britain's biggest power station owner, Drax, which is accused of cutting down environmentally important forests in Canada while receiving billions of quid in green energy subsidies from British taxpayers. And back come the boomerangs. According to a new survey, one-fifth of adults aged 18 to 24, 34 even are intending to move back with their mams and dads to cope with rising living costs. But first, here's the news with Polly Middlehurst. Darren, thank you. And our top story today, nine people are now confirmed to have died and the number of dead is expected to rise after an explosion at a petrol station in Ireland. It's understood the petrol station was the hub of the village in a tight-knit community there. Northern Ireland's Fire and Rescue Service left the scene a short while ago after helping with the search and rescue efforts. The operation now understood to have changed to a recovery mission with emergency services already having worked right through the night. Ireland's Premier, Mikhail Martin, says the nation is mourning, while Donegal TD Charlie McGonalogue said his constituency is struggling to come to terms with the incident. Creaselook is a small village, um, but the, the shop is, is, is right at the heart of it and uh, most people in the community would be in the shop at some stage over the course of the day. Um, so everyone, you know, it's there for the grace of God go. Everyone in the local community who would, who would, who would frequent the shop so often. Um, so uh, it's, it's a, sh a shocking time. Well, two local bishops in Creesler in County Donoghue have said the community is rallying around those affected. This tragedy will remain with this town forever and there are families that have had the most devastating news that they will never get over, but they'll find strength from each other. You know, this is a, a county that is renowned for being a big-hearted county and the people who are going through this time will be taken to the hearts of the people of, of this village, this, this whole community, and our thoughts and our prayers are with them. County Donegal Bishop's there speaking and we hope to bring you a news conference in about half an hour's time with the very latest on that. In the meantime, in international news, a large explosion has destroyed the only road bridge linking occupied Crimea and Russia today. 
Footage widely shared online shows an explosion on the Kerf Bridge, believed to have taken place in the early hours of this morning. According to the Russian authorities, three people died in the blast. Russian state media claimed the train journeys on the adjacent rail bridge will restart later today. Meanwhile, an advisor to Ukraine's President Zelensky described the incident as just the beginning, but didn't directly claim Ukrainian responsibility for the blast. The UK has exported lamb to the United States for the first time since 1989. Liz Truss has hailed the move a milestone after President Joe Biden lifted his country's decades-old ban on imports of British meat in September last year. The market is worth an estimated £37 million in the first five years of trade. Celebrating the news on Twitter, the Prime Minister said the move marked a well-deserved boost to our rural economy. Only one in five trains are expected to run today across Scotland, England and Wales. Members of the RMT union are staging their eighth strike in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The train's operator, chief negotiator, Tim Shoveler, says passengers should only travel by train if absolutely necessary. And the RMT's General Secretary, Mick Lynch, has warned of further strikes to come. We will adapt and negotiate to, any, to, to new conditions and we've, we've adapted new technology all along. But that doesn't explain why these members standing behind me now haven't had a pay rise for three years while the companies are extracting £500 million in profit last year. And as expected, thousands of people will form a human chain around Parliament today, calling for the release of the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Mr Assange is currently being held in Belmarsh Prison in London amid a legal battle to avoid extradition to the United States, where he's wanted over the leak of secret military information. Former PR adviser Richard Hillgrove says it's important for journalism that Assange is freed. The fact that this is being led not so much from Don't Extradite Assange again, um, but the National Union of Journalists and the International Federation of Journalists, which has 600,000 members globally, are uh, leading this exercise means, you know, the penny is dropping that this is not, a, you know, this is political. This, this puts journalism in the firing line. Um, if Assange goes down, journalism goes down. That's it for now. We're back at half past with more news as it happens. Now let's get back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome to Real Britain. Here's what's coming up on the show today. At the Tory party conference, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, made calls for a blanket ban on people who come to Britain illegally. She's also considering new laws making it easier to deport them. But is it likely to happen? Is it legal? Also, Britain's biggest power station owner, Drax, is receiving millions of pounds in green subsidies from the British taxpayer, whilst being accused of cutting down environmentally important forests in Canada. They deny it. And football legend Gary Neville is being called a hypocrite after it emerged he'll be working for the Qatari state-run broadcaster during the World Cup. That's despite previous comments he's made waxing lyrical about the treatment of migrant workers in the Gulf. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, though, your thoughts are much more important than mine. What do you reckon about this blanket ban? Do you think migrants who went to the UK illegally should be stopped from seeking asylum. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Watch us online on YouTube and our Facebook page. Loads of brilliant content there. Cheers very much. Before all that, I don't know about you, but I want you to ask yourself whether it's millionaire footballers waxing lyrical about the nasty Tories whilst accepting work from dodgy authoritarian regimes. Or millionaire Hollywood lovies telling us all about the need to be more compassionate when it comes to refugees from mansions with more bedrooms than Versailles. I'm sick to death of the virtue signalling and the hectoring. Have a listen to this glistening array of millionaires for the Refugee Council. You're a mother fleeing with your toddler and a baby from bombs falling on your home. You're a criminal. You're an elderly grandmother, you have trouble walking, and you're trying to reunite with family. You're a criminal. 
The sanctimonious screeching from the lefty lovies comes days after Home Secretary Suella Braverman committed to deporting anyone who doesn't enter the UK through government-sanctioned routes. So come of those who are actually travelling across the English Channel, they won't be able to claim asylum once they arrive here. And if you ask me, that's absolutely the right approach. As much as the Guardian reading Twitter classes might argue otherwise. Just for my radio listeners, this is a Guardian piece that says, Think Pretty Patel was bad. Suella Braverman wants to make claiming asylum near impossible. Well, folks, the cost of Britain's asylum system to the British taxpayer has soared to a whopping 2.1 billion quid. That's an increase of £756 million, or 56%, over the previous year. Why should we, as taxpayers, hard-pressed taxpayers, squeezed to a pulp, be expected to offer bed, board and benefits to those entering our country illegally? How do we know these people share our values? How many are here to engage in criminality? It's an utter farce that we view those travelling from France as people escaping a war-torn nation. Last time I checked, the only thing you'll be attacked by in France is cholesterol after a diet of cheese baguettes and wine. We in Britain don't treat those struggling as criminals. Genuine refugees can make an application and if they're genuinely fleeing war and terror, then fine, hunky-dory, happy days, you're accepted. However, economic migrants escape and centrist dad Emmanuel Macron of France are treated like criminals because guess what? They're paying people traffickers to break the law and illegally enter our country. It's absolutely right that those with precious little regard for the laws of our land are precluded from benefiting from the generosity of our taxpayers. Throughout my life, the British people have sought political leaders who've promised to bring down immigration, bringing it under control in this country after a spade of terror attacks, a lack of integration into British life and the depression of the wages of our least well-off. It's about time that they finally got what they continuously vote for. It barely featured during the summer's Tory leadership election. And the Brexit vote was in large part such a shock to the political and media class in Britain because the British people finally said a stern no to their wishes. It was a stern no in favour of British voters receiving the right to decide what happens here in Britain. And what we want is a common-sense approach to migration and asylum. And make no mistake, a failure to get serious on Boardless Britain will see the Conservative Party reduced to such a backbench political party that it's fallen off the affirmation bench. We all know that the Labour Party are much more relaxed, supremely relaxed, about our poorest borders. But if the Tories continue to refute the Home Secretary when she calls for Britain to be free from the clutches of European courts and actually take back the ability to make our own rules, well, folks, they'll be relegated to the dustbin of electoral history. From bodacious Boris and his 80-seat majority to lifeless Liz and her parliamentary party of pygmies. So how are Liz? Back Suella. Your Home Secretary gets that offering sanctuary to genuine refugees is A-OK, -okay, but continuing unfettered access and bed, board and benefits for those who purport to be so ain't OK. Now, following her speech at the Conservative Party conference this week, Suella Braverman revealed plans for new laws which will impose a blanket ban on anyone deemed to be entering the UK illegally from seeking refuge or asylum. It comes after the government's plan to deport anyone considered to have arrived in the UK illegally to Rwanda was, of course, stalled following an intervention by the European Court of Human Rights. So how feasible is this idea by the new Home Secretary and is it legal? Well, to break this down further, I'm joined by the immigration consultant Dean Morgan and specialist immigration lawyer Ivan Sampson. Dean, 
As an immigration consultant, you know more than most, right, about the kind of topics that we've just been talking about here, the legal processes and the costs put in place to yes. actually get to this country legally. Do you welcome these announcements by the Home Secretary? Yeah, I certainly welcome it. I mean, you never... They hear about the millions of people every year, like my clients, that uh, submit their applications overseas, they follow due process, they pay an exorbitant amount of fees nowadays, thousands of pounds per applicant, you know, to come here and follow due process. And we're a nation of laws. You know, the people that are fleeing the countries overseas, are they a nation of laws or are they lawless countries or countries that are facing conflict and war? And so if you're coming to the UK and your first act is to break our laws to get here, and, you know, the media always says, and correct me if I'm wrong, that people are paying tens of thousands of pounds to people smugglers to help them get across the channel. Well, they have the money to apply for, you know, following due process apply for the visas that my clients apply for. So I can only assume that they're not following due process because they assume that they won't qualify for a visa or they won't be allowed to come here. So they decide to disregard, travel through five to 15 safe countries because international law provides for people that are fleeing mm -hmm. conflict. You should get to the first safest country and you should wait out the conflict there. And that enables you then to go back and help rebuild your country once that conflict ends. But you're traveling through five to 15 safe countries to come to the UK. Are you an economic migrant or are you a refugee? Because again, you're disregarding international law, you're disregarding British law. That can't be the best foundation for people coming to the UK, surely. So Dean, just to sum that up, what you're saying is actually your clients who are genuinely seeking to come to Britain through legal channels, this is actually yeah. creating an unfair balance in the system. Well, that's the thing, because I speak to, you know, we have many clients that are British and they, we help uh, their, their wives and, and husbands to come here on spouse visas. And obviously the British, you know, uh, person's regularly making comments because of what they read in the media. And obviously they're saying, well, look, you know, we're having to wait up to six months for our spouse visa applications worldwide to be processed, allegedly because of the Ukraine family crisis. Um, and, you know, it's just not fair. We do everything right, and, and it's taken a long time. It costs us thousands of pounds. Yet people that just have total disregard for the law turn up here, get bored, bed, everything done for them, when the people here are struggling with the cost of living crisis. Absolutely. Ivan Sampson there, special immigration lawyer. What's you on what you've heard so far? Well, I think my friend's a bit confused about the law, to be quite frank with you. So in my 30 years experience of practicing uh, immigration and asylum law, first of all, we're members of the Refugee Convention. And what that means is we have an international obligation to comply with the terms of that convention. So let's just take Article 28 for, for the start. So Article 28 says that you can, you're permitted to use, uh, come into the UK illegally. Um, so you can enter illegally into a country and the um, receiving country has to see, uh, accept it as a good cause if you are a genuine asylum seeker. Second point, Article 34, that talks about using false identity documents. So you can actually use a false identity document under the Refugee Convention to enter a country. Now, you, you're shaking your head. I but am. There's a you reason, can, there's a, there's a reason so. for that. My By radio way, listeners, I am absolutely shaking my head. There's a reason for this, um, and it's humanitarian. People, genuine refugees fleeing persecution run for their lives. They may not have a genuine, they may not even have a passport. Um, they may not, may not be able to prove their identity. Now, the other point is, as well as um, the laws that we have to comply with regard to Refugee Convention, also, um, are you aware that 50% of the people coming across the channel are genuine refugees. And that's the Home Office's own figures. So, so Ivan, we know could that- you, Could you just answer me a question? Because I think many of my viewers will be confused right now. If that's the case, how can we see scenes of people throwing their documentation into the channel coming over here in the dinghies? Why are they doing that if they are genuine cases of refugees who could seek sanctuary in this country? Uh, well, as I said, if you're, if you're not a genuine refugee, you should be removed. And this is the problem with this policy, because, number one, I think it will be deemed to be unlawful as the, the, the new laws that are being brought in to make it a criminal offence to even 
come across the channel. That was deemed by the court to be unlawful, and this policy will follow the same route. No, no, listen, if you're not a genuine refugee, make it quite clear you have no place to be in the UK. However, okay. what you're doing is throwing the baby with the bathwater. So you have 50% of people coming across the channel are genuine. We've got to treat them fairly. We can't so, treat them in the same way as uh, those who are coming here who are not genuine. Thank you, Ivan. Dean, I just want to bring you back in on that because Ivan knows more about the law and the refugee conventions than I certainly do. But I'm wondering, and I... I'm damn sure, actually, that many of my viewers will be wondering this as well. If that's what the law says, if these are what those conventions says, we need to leave the conventions and change the laws. Yeah, I mean, I would totally agree with that. We're a tiny little island. I've been very fortunate this lifetime to live in Australia, India, America. We're tiny. And to say that people can just have the right to come here, this has to change. Because if you think four years ago, 3,000 people a year were, were risking their own lives and the lives of our, of our military and uh, you know, border force that are trying to save them and help them. But it's 30,000 this year, 30. You know, and if 50 percent of them aren't coming here lawfully, then this is just a completely bad practice that has to be stopped. Now, to try to deter people from coming here has got to be the government's stated objective. And if that means, you know, removing ourselves from conventions or conventions being amended to reflect the reality on the ground. Because I have to say as well, I, I see that people are traveling from France to get here. Like you said earlier, what conflicts are they fleeing in France or Germany or Poland or the 10 other countries they've left? I mean, to say that you can just come here uh, again, how can we have a social welfare system? Because I never hear the left or anyone on that side of things coming up with solutions. If you just let everyone that's in a conflict zone come here, this is hundreds of millions of humans. Yeah. And they can't that's fit on this island. We can't have an NHS. We can't have schooling that, that's paid for. And the thing is, is that if everyone comes here from the countries that can't offer their people these services and this quality of life, well, then we won't have that either if it continues and it's hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, uh, Dean, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. But yes, I couldn't agree with you more. Immigration consultant Dean Morgan and the specialist say on that? immigration lawyer, Ivan, Ivan, we've I'd got to end it there, I'd love to see Dean in a room full of 80,000 Ukrainians who are here and explain that policy to them. Are we going okay. to send them back, Dean? Is that what we're going to do? No, they can follow due process. They apply from overseas through an embassy yeah. and we follow the law. Exactly. You don't just make up the rules and come here because you feel like it. That's it. We'll have to end it there. But thank you both for your time. There's plenty more to come, folks, on Real Britain this afternoon. Next, we're going to be discussing how Britain's biggest power station is receiving millions of quid, your money, in green energy subsidies, whilst being accused of cutting down environmentally important forests in Canada. But first, let's have a look at the weather. So looking ahead to this evening's weather then and the UK looking mostly fine with clear sunny spells, a few showers though in the northwest. Let's home in. It's going to be a dry start to the evening across the southwest of England, fairly clear skies and uh, no more than a gentle wind blowing. Then high pressure will be in charge of the weather across the southeast, keeping it dry and settled with long clear periods developing. Some patchy cloud drifting in across Wales, but the weather's staying fine there. And some also clear spells at times. And a similar weather setup expected as we head across to the Midlands. And the day ending on a quiet note with a good deal of dry and at times reasonably clear weather all round. Away from the North Pennines, where we could see some cloud, the northeast of England heading into the evening on a fine note as well. A slight southwesterly breeze is expected though. And that breeze, fairly noticeable as we head north towards Scotland, although there will be clear spells in the east. Further west, more in the way of cloud, and showers expected there as well. Northern Ireland could catch a shower or two as well, but mainly towards the north and the west of the province and elsewhere. Although it will be a little breezy, the weather does look fine. So turning chilly across southern and eastern areas overnight under broken cloud. Meanwhile, winds strengthening in the northwest with rain arriving. And that's how the weather's shaping up this Sunday.
Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you very much for your company. Now, before we get into an investigation this week claiming that a company has... Oh, we are going to go straight to a company that has received billions of pounds in green energy subsidies from UK taxpayers, cutting down environmentally important forests in Canada. It's called Drax, which runs the Britain's biggest power station. And they're accused of burning millions of tonnes of imported wood pellets which, although are classed as renewable energy, actually produce more greenhouse gases than coal. So is this an example of climate hypocrisy slash stupidity? Well, with me now is the head of policy at Net Zero Watch, Harry Wilkinson. Harry, I thank you for your time. I mean, dare I say this is actually the BBC doing something called journalism, because that's how I saw this story, in actually covering this stuff. Does it call into question, Harry, the lunacy of much of this so-called green stuff. Well, thank you, Darren, for having me on uh, this afternoon. Um, yes, I think it does. We look at uh, the Drax power station and we see that it's actually the largest recipient of renewable energy subsidies uh, in the country. So this is the flagship net zero project, if you like. And yet the uh, green implications of this are not good. No one could reasonably describe this as green. As you say, the emissions at the chimney are higher than coal. And yet the way that we look our, at our emissions at the moment, we count it as having zero emissions uh, whatsoever because those trees come from Canada, maybe they come from America, maybe they come from the Baltic countries. Uh, those emissions are said to take place elsewhere. And so this is a, this is a um, manipulation, really, of, of the statistics. We're not honestly looking at our carbon dioxide emissions. We're using clever fixes to try and pretend that we're being green when we're actually not. And Drax, if you look at the company, is one that's very close to government. I was at the Conservative Party conference last week. Drax sponsored many events. They're also very close to the Committee on Climate Change. So this is classic... Uh, vested interests, a company with big, a uh, big lobbying arm that's really directing a lot of public money to a technology that's really quite polluting. It's in one of the most polluting power stations in Europe. It's in the top 10 most polluting power stations in Europe. And yet we turned a blind eye to it and we celebrate it as part of our green ambitions. So this is something that I'm very glad that the BBC has now turned its eye to. Uh, and yeah. hopefully some more scrutiny will, will be very welcome. 
And Harry Drax, of course, would say, well, hang on a minute, you know, I refute all of the claims that you've just made. But a lot of my viewers watching this, seeing the scenes, and for my radio listeners there, you can see the deforestation that actually takes place for this so-called renewable technology. But I'm wondering, we've precluded the use of coal in this country, right? We've, got, we've gotten rid of coal-powered fire station, power stations, rather, and we're saying, well, we cannot use gas anymore. And as a consequence, people this winter are going to have a really tough time here in Britain. So many of my viewers will be utterly frustrated, driven round the twist, thinking, what on earth are we doing, Harry? Well, there are other physical realities to bear in mind here. Wind and solar, as you will know, can't be relied on all the time. The wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. That fundamental problem hasn't been addressed. And so we need actual reliable technologies like coal, like biomass in this case, and like gas. And unless we provide those sources of energy, people uh, will just uh, face blackouts and won't have energy when they need it. So this is the yeah, consequence, it, of, I think, a very uh, messed up thinking. We've got to get right back to basics with net zero. And we've got to be thinking about the broader environmental consequences of our decisions and measuring those up with the economic implications, the cost of energy, and of course, security of supply. And yet we see this very short term misthinking driven by the Committee on Climate Change changes five-year carbon budgets, which demand the government sets out a plan every five years to continue this very fast trajectory of re reducing our emissions. And so no one's stepping back and thinking, do yeah. these policies actually make sense? Absolutely. Harry, will end it there, but I couldn't agree with you more. Head of policy at Net Zero Watch there, Harry Wilkinson. Now, GB News contacted Drax for a statement and they deny the accusations. This is what they had to say. Drax does not harvest forests. The forests in British Columbia are harvested for high-value timber used in construction, not the production of biomass. Drax uses sustainable biomass to produce 12% of the UK's renewable electricity and plays a critical role in keeping the lights on for millions of homes and businesses across the country. Company went on to say the United Nations IPCC the world's leading climate authority says sustainable biomass will play a critical role in meeting global climate targets. Drax's own world-leading sustainable sourcing policies are aligned with the rigorous regulatory framework set by both the Canadian and UK governments, ensuring that our operations provide benefits to nature, the climate and people. I'll let you decide, folks, what you all think of that story. Yes, so with GB News and Telly and DAB Radio, next I'm going to be talking about footy legend Gary Neville, who'll be working with the Qatari state-run broadcaster at next month's World Cup, despite condemning the treatment of migrant workers in the Gulf. So is he a hypocrite? First, folks, here's a check on the news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Darren, thank you and good afternoon to you. The sad news coming to us from Ireland that nine people are now thought to have died and the number of dead expected to rise after an explosion at a service station in Ireland. It's understood the Apple Green petrol station was the hub of the tight-knit village of Creesla in County Donegal. Northern Ireland's Fire and Rescue Service, who travelled across the border to help with the search and rescue effort, left the scene a short time ago. The operation surrounding that area now understood to have changed to a recovery mission from a search and rescue mission. Emergency services already having worked right through the night. It's a community in shock. We know and we are expecting an update from the Garda, the Irish police, shortly, and we hope to bring you that live here on GB News. In the meantime, let's bring you up to date with other headlines this hour. And the serial killer Peter Tobin, we understand, has died after becoming unwell in prison. He was serving a life sentence for raping and murdering the Polish student Angelika Kluke. He was also serving two life sentences for the murders of 15-year-old schoolgirl Vicky Hamilton and 18-year-old Dinah McNichol in 1991. Their bodies were found 17 years later buried in the garden of his former home in Kent. 
International news and a large explosion has destroyed the only road bridge linking occupied Crimea and Russia and heavily damaged an adjacent rail bridge. Footage widely shared online today shows an explosion on the Kirsch Bridge, which is believed to have taken place in the early hours of this morning. Travel across that bridge now clearly impossible. An advisor to Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky describing the incident as the beginning but not directly claiming Ukrainian responsibility. And in the UK, only around one in five trains are running today across Scotland, England and Wales as members of the RMT union staged their eighth strike in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The train's operator, chief negotiator Tim Shoveler says passengers should only be travelling by train if it's absolutely necessary. Meanwhile, the RMT's General Secretary Mick Lynch is warning of further strikes to come. We've already brought you that story about the bridge in Crimea undergoing that explosion in the early hours of this morning. Just recapping the pictures there on that one. As I said, we are expecting to take you to County Donegal, uh, where the Guard of the Police will be holding a news conference very soon on the events that have unfolded uh, since yesterday evening in that small, tight-knit community of Chrysler, where nine people are believed to have lost their lives in an explosion at a petrol station. But in the meantime, let's get back to Darren. Hello, welcome back. Before we go to that press conference with the sad, horrible scenes that have been taking place, we'll uh, come to that as soon as we get it. But first up, I want to talk about Liz Truss drawing up plans to overhaul what she calls a convoluted subsidised childcare system that could hand money directly to families instead of nurseries. At present, Parents of all three- and four-year-olds in England can claim 15 hours of free care a week for 38 weeks of the year, and the money is paid directly to nurseries. However, under new plans, parents would be handed the money to spend on childcare as they see fit, including giving the money to grandparents that are helping with childcare. Well, with me to discuss these plans is the Tory MP, Miriam Cates MP. Miriam... These plans sound good to me because I tell you what I've been quite conscious of. The fact that we seem to be handing more and more away from the parent to the state. Are you concerned about that as well? Yes, I am. I mean, I think there are much bigger issues about childcare and parenting uh, than just this three-year-old and four-year-old funding. But I do think this is an excellent idea because I think a lot of parents kind of face this choice at the moment of, uh, of feeling like they need to go back to work when their child is three, financially needing to go back to work, but not really liking what's on offer or it not being suitable. So if you work shifts, if you don't have an easy pattern of work, uh, funded childcare is not always uh, the best offer. It's also not always the best for the child, I don't think. And I do think it's a good idea to be able to use grandparents and childminders uh, and more at-home care. But I'd also like to see it be extended to actually a cash offer to parents so they can use it to, to not work so many hours and look after the children themselves. So I do think that's usually in the child's best interests. Yeah, do you think there needs to be a look at the, the whole regulatory system that we've got as far as childcare is concerned? Because we in this country... As far as the OECD is concerned, comparing ourselves with like-minded, similar nations, we experience extremely high childcare costs in this country, don't we? We do. But I think, as I said, I think there's much bigger issues behind it. And one of the reasons that families find it so difficult in this country is because of our tax system. So we have a very individualised tax system in, in this country. The Treasury only sees you as an individual. Uh, they see your gross pay, if you like, and tax you on that basis. Whereas in most other comparable countries, people have an option to be taxed as a household or a couple. And so the number of dependents you have, the number of children you're bringing up is taken into account. And so, of course, as a family then, if you have dependents, you pay less tax and more of your money goes into be able to helping to raise your children. Whereas in this country, we have complete gaps in the system. So, for example, between the ages of six months, where normally maternity pay ends for the mother and three years when the childcare vouchers start, we don't have a policy at all. There is no help either to stay at home and there's no help 
with childcare. So there's an enormous gap in our policy at the moment. So I do very much welcome these plans, I think, putting power back in the hands of parents, enabling more parents to have a better choice about how they look after their children is a good thing. But I do think we need much bigger considerations about our tax system and about what parents are supposed to do in those early years. Absolutely. Well, let's hope Trust gets looking at those taxes as well. Now, Miriam, I want to talk about your really important piece in The Telegraph today on the Mermaids controversy. That's a charity for those of my viewers who don't know. But many have been getting in touch saying, look what this, look what Miriam Cates has said today. I, I love it. Should the government be actually prioritising these sort of things, looking into what charities like Mermaids are doing? Because I'm wondering... Do many parents even know, Miriam, what's going on these days where you've, you know, you've potentially got a child who's been sent a, a, um, a what do you call them, Miriam? These these breast... Um, breast to, exactly, yeah, being sent these kinds of things and not knowing about it. How much has this actually been going on? Well, that is the question, Darren, isn't it? it? The fact is, this has been happening behind parents' backs, and that's why so many parents don't know about it, or when they do find out about it, where, why they are so outraged and so frightened. And I think it's easy to paint this story as a, a story about trans rights, but it's not. It's a story about a safeguarding failure. I mean, sadly, we know that there are people in our society who mean children harm, or who do harm without meaning to, and that's why we have such strong safeguarding procedures in our schools, in our society, society. But of course, those procedures only work if they apply to everyone. And the best protection for children is to be with their parents, with their families. Of course, parents don't always get everything right. I know that as a mother of three. Uh, but it's stating the obvious. There's nobody who's more biologically, more emotionally invested in the welfare of a child than their parents. So the first rule of safeguarding is that we should be very nervous about anyone who tries to cut children off from their parents, who encourages children to keep secrets from their family. It doesn't matter how trendy their viewpoint or how progressive their agenda, that is a risk if someone or some organization is trying to cut children off from their parents. Predators look for loopholes. If we allow those loopholes to exist, uh, they will be exploited. And that's what's happened here. I'm afraid mermaids and other charities and, and, and institutions that have bought into this kind of extreme gender identity theory have gone down the route of cutting children off from their parents. And that's why we've got this enormous uh, safeguarding scandal now. So, Miriam, what I would say is mermaids have denied allegations of safeguarding failures and actually said that they're the victim of a smear campaign. And that comes as the National Lottery, of course, has paused a £500,000 grant to the charity. So there's a lot going on there, Miriam. We're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for your time. As ever, that was the fantastic MP, Miriam Cates, for Peniston and Stocksbridge. Now, the new darling of the British left, former footy player Gary Neville, has been accused of hypocrisy after it emerged he, he will work for a Qatari state-run broadcaster at next month's World Cup. That's despite condemning the abhorrent treatment of migrant workers in the Gulf country in a documentary only last week. That was focusing on its human rights record. Neville responded to the criticism by saying he would continue to highlight human rights issues, as he has done for years. Now, joining me to discuss this further is friend of the show, sports writer for The Sun, Justin Allen. Justin, thank you very much for your time. Tell us more about what... what do we know much detail about Gary Neville's deal with, um, with the Qatari-run sports channel? Well, I think you'll find it's a lot of money, <laughs> put it that way. I'm mean, looking that it's going to be a, a six figure sum. Um, but yeah, he's going to be sort of commenting on the World Cup. He's going to be doing interviews and all that sort of stuff, really. I mean, you know, he obviously is out there a lot. He's doing a lot for Sky Sports, he's doing a lot for ITV Sport and um, Ben in Sport on top. So what do you reckon about his left-wing credentials? Because obviously Gary Neville, for many of my viewers, will have seen him at Labour Party conference, sat there like a, grinning like a Cheshire cat with Sakir Starmer. His left-wing credentials, surely they've taken a bit of a hit as a result of this, have they? Yeah, I mean, look, Gary Neville, uh, Darren, is the worst type of hypocrite. He really is. He goes around spouting social... Don't hold back, and Justin. Then Don't he... hold back. <laughs> and, there he, and there he is, signing up for Benning Sport, you know, uh, a Qatari state-run broadcast. I mean, let's not forget, in Qatar, 5,000 construction workers have died in the build-up to this tournament, uh, putting together the stadiums. You can go to prison there for being homosexual. 
Women get treated like second-class citizens. And, and it's absolutely staggering that he's signed up for them. And in June, um, I mean, don't forget David Beckham um, agreed to be the face uh, and ambassador of the World Cup. Gary Neville actually interviewed his former Manchester United colleague in Qatar in June, and not once did he challenge him about it. Um, you know, what, what I find interesting about Gary Neville, he's a man who has an opinion on everything our government does, yet he doesn't seem to have as much of an opinion on the shortcomings of the Qatar government, and I wonder why that is. Well, Qatar have actually revealed the rules, haven't they, that they're going to put in place during the World Cup. It's ranging on its alcohol restrictions to rules on COVID and all the rest of it. What, what have they actually announced? Are, are they going to sort of liberalise all of these things in order to bring in Westerners to, to the World Cup? I think there'll be a little bit of a soft touch. There'll be sort of alcohol zones. There'll almost be like a Western zone around stadiums, I suppose, and there'll be a little bit of an amnesty around the tournament. But mark my words, it'll all go back to normal straight after the tournament. I mean, I think, I mean, a lot of people would agree that it's staggering that the tournament's being even held there. Look, it's not for us to tell another country how to run things in their own country. Absolutely not. But when you have something like a World Cup, which is a global event, I think it's very important that there are core values that all countries agree around. Basic human rights, like it's OK to be homosexual. It's, you know, it, it's just things like that. And, and I just think, unfortunately, it's all been a bit of a mess from the moment that they, you know, agreed, FIFA agreed to stage the World Cup there this winter. Yeah, because you mentioned David Beckham. He was accused of stamping out hope for the LGBT plus community in Qatar for his promotional work that you mentioned around the World Cup. Both Neville and Beckham have basically been accused of essentially accepting these large sums of cash that we, you know, goodness only knows how much, whilst turning the other cheek to human rights abuses. I mean, is that a fair thing to say in your opinion? I mean, we, as a country, have many ties to these kind of nations, don't we? Yeah, I think when you're virtue signalling in the way that Gary Neville and David Beckham does, you have to exercise a degree of self-sacrifice. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, for example, companies like Hummel, for example, and Sainsbury's, I mean, Sainsbury's, you know, made a big thing about pride, you know, and there they are selling products to Saudi Arabia, one of the countries with the worst human rights records and certainly dis discriminatory against the LGBT community. I think you have to, if you're doing the virtual signaling, you have to be whiter than white. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Gary Neville and David Beckham, you know, are like most people, not whiter than white. And the main interest really, in my eyes, for both of those uh, gentlemen, is their own self-interest. The most important thing... Just lost Justin there. Sports writer for The Sun there, though, Justin Allen, who did not, I think you'll agree, did not hold back. Following the announcement, the footballing legend actually took to Twitter, though, to say, yes, I'm going to the World Cup, and yes, I will be working for being... I, I will highlight those issues, like I have, for years. Well, I'll let you decide whose side is are on there. Now, according to a new survey by Aviva, one-fifth of adults aged between 18 and 34 who currently have their own place intend to boomerang back to the parental home in coming months. As, of course, the cost of living crisis, generation-defining inflation, continues to bite. It means as many as two million adult kids could soon be sleeping in their childhood bedrooms. So what are we going to do about all of this? Well, to give her thoughts on this story as someone who falls into this age category, the political commentator, Lettuce Bromovsky. Lettuce, thank you very much for your time. Lettuce, you well, know somebody, afternoon, correct me if I'm wrong, you know someone who's planning to or already has moved back in with the parents because of this cost of living crisis, mm -hmm. don't you? Yeah, yeah. So I've got a, a house of some of my friends. They all live together. There's three of them. And two of them are moving back home. They're not going to renew their lease. They're moving back home to just help deal with this financial issue. The third girl, unfortunately, her parents don't live in London, so that's not an option for her. Um, but I think what I've seen and what you were just saying, a lot of the articles in the news around this at the moment are how are the parents going to deal with the, uh, their children moving home again, what parents should do, how they should manage this situation. 
But it's not just about the parents here. We need to look at this from the perspective of a young person. This isn't a choice for them. We're being forced into this situation because of these external factors of financial issues. I mean, no one when they leave home at 18 goes, don't worry, mom and dad, you know, I'm going to see you again in five or six years because I can't afford to pay my rent or I can't afford to pay my energy bills or I've got about £50,000 worth of student debt that's got 7% interest rates on it. You know, this isn't what people want. And a lot of people, young people, young adults, when they move out of the big city or they go to university and they get their first job, it's a very low income salary. So you're not earning lots of money and benefits for young people in these situations. They're not that great. For example, you don't get um, a housing cost benefit. So there are so many financial situations that aren't there to support these young people. Um, and it's not a choice. And I think that's really important for people to understand. Many of my viewers will be saying, well, not in my house, thank you very much. They're not coming back now. They'll quite like, you know, being in their retirement and having their home to themselves and be worried about the fact that their children might have to come back because of the financial yeah. constraints that we're all experiencing. But I'm wondering, Lettuce, have you got any thoughts around what this actually means for wider society? Because it'll mean fewer marriages, right? Because people won't be able to move in with each other. It'll mean fewer children because people aren't in their own homes able to actually bring a child into the household. Mm. There are gonna be so many societal knock-on effects by what is essentially a frozen infantilization of an entire generation. Isn't it? Well, I think you're right on some of those points because there's going to have to be a serious conversation between these parents and their children who are now adults about how their relationship's going to progress going forward. You know, when you move out of home, you've got this independence and this freedom. It's so exciting. You know, you can go out on a Tuesday night and stay out for as long or as late as you want to. You might regret it the next day, but that's your choice going home, it's now who's going to do the cooking? If you go out, what's your sort of curfew? How much are you going to contribute to bills? And whether it's that longer term effect of how long are you actually planning on staying at home? Some parents might find that idea sort of terrifying. Um, but it also, it comes at both sides. You know, it's not just young people who are dealing with this cost of living crisis. A lot of families who are from low and middle income um, backgrounds, they're going to need potentially more people to help them pay maybe their mortgage. We've seen mortgage rates have been going up significantly recently. Um, everyone's got their energy bills and having another person in the house who's going to contribute to that, that's going to be beneficial for the parents as well as the child, perhaps. So it's sort of two sides to this coin. What do you say to some of my viewers who will be saying, oh, come on, let us get off it, right? I remember when interest rates were sky high, double digits when I bought my house, that was genuine struggle. You know, the last generation really struggled to buy yeah. their own homes too. What do you say to those people who are saying, well, actually, I'm hearing you moan and groan lettuce, but I just don't buy it. Well, I won't speak to those people, but I'll speak to Liz Truss and the government and say reform planning, get rid of this bureaucracy. Let's liberalize it all so that house prices will come down, so that rents will come down and people will be able to get on that property market. In 1995, for example, two thirds of young adults, so people between 25 and 34, were already on that property market. Now it's only around a quarter. So we have seen a huge reduction in the number of people who are even allowed to get onto that. We need to give people the chance to do that. And at the moment, with all these skyrocketing prices, it just seems impossible. And people won't be getting onto that property ladder. They might not be moving out of their parents' house for many years to come. Let us then, I'm wondering, do you reckon there's an argument to be had here to say that we just need to have fewer young people living in London, for example? I mean, that's sort of a hard conversation to have or a hard argument to push because this is where the jobs are. Young people move to London as a sort of exciting London or any other big city really in the UK. It's sort of where lots of jobs are. There's lots of prosperity. It's where young people go out together, lots of restaurants. It's a very, very social sort of place. And it's where people want to be. And I don't think you can say to anyone, you know, oh, you can't go there because it's too expensive. We need to accommodate for these people 
people so that anyone can live anywhere that they choose kind of thing. And yeah, rents are high, but there are different areas of London where it might be lower. You know, you don't live so much in central as you do sort of out towards the east, which is where I live with my friends at the moment. But it, it's a long conversation. And really, at the end of the day, we've got to get finances under control. We've got to allow for more planning to go ahead and for it not to be so complicated. And there has to be a bit of more support and consideration, perhaps, for young people who are having to battle all of this and not see moving back home as a sort of regression and failure of themselves, but as just a sort of stepping stone to, it's OK, I'm going home, but I've got a plan, a financial plan. I'm going to save x amount each month and within a year um i'm going to be moving back out again you know this is for now it's not forever all right let us bring off bromovsky thank you very much for your time on that topic now folks it's time for grime watch a time to look at what you at home have been telling me about the biggest stories of the week yesterday two vegan activists from animal rebellion poured milk all hour to high-end London department stores in a supposed protest against the use of dairy products. Now, following this census act, I took to Twitter stating that I would be one of the, those shouting abuse at these petulant prats. Fortnum and Mason can afford more milk. The cleaners and the floor staff are the ones that will be left to deal with the mess that they've left. How dare they assume they can force their lifestyle on all of us. This has got a lot of you at home animated. Loads of you have been getting in touch, so let's see what you've had to say. Stephen said, the store security should have detained them, which they are entitled to do, or at least call the police to verify their details and then pursue them for civil recovery. The problem with all of this stuff is they simply do what they do and walk away. And listen, I tell you right now, Stephen, if this had happened in, you know, Keithley instead of Knightsbridge and uh, Aldi and Keithley instead of Harrods or Fortnum and Mason's in Knightsbridge, these people, vegans with their gangly, horrible beards and all the rest of it, would have been used as human mops quicker than you can click your fingers. I'll tell you that much for free. Pete says, this is unacceptable behaviour. I think animal rebellion are criminals, and I hope strong action is taken against these people. Well, Pete, you'll know as well as I do that if you've got certain political opinions in Britain, the police say, now to see here, folks. Jess says, I don't think they're trying to force their lifestyles on us. It's just that they realise we can't treat animals as slaves and they want to go public about it. I love cheese and milk, but they're right. We should all go vegan. Well, Jess, all I can say to you, pet, is you do what you want, right? You can wear your fake leather, you can wear plastic, do whatever you want, eat what you want, buy your oat milk lattes and all the rest of it, your quinoa salads. But Jess, I won't be following you anytime soon. Thank you very much. You do not have a right to force that lifestyle onto other people and my viewers. Matt says, how can they waste food like that when people are starving in certain parts of the world? Usually because of the same far left ideologies that many of these activists support. And actually, Matt has raised a really important point there. Of course, we've also got a cost of living crisis in this country with rising costs of these sort of goods that have been poured all our these department stores. What I want to say is I think these organisations like Extinction Rebellion, like this Animal Rebellion, they are front organisations advertising that we abolish capitalism and some say get rid of the nuclear family and all of these other things. So, Matt, I think you're bang on there. Now, folks, we're going to go live to that press conference that we were hearing in Ireland now to find out about the horrible scenes that have taken place. I want to acknowledge representatives from other state and voluntary services who have provided invaluable support over the last 24 hours, including the Irish Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Rescue Helicopter 118, Irish Air Corps Medivac 112, Northern Ireland Ambulance HEM Service, Irish Community Air Ambulance, Northern Ireland Urban Search and Rescue, Meva Fire Service, Donegal Mountain Rescue, Northern Ireland Ambulance Service Heart Team, Donegal County Council Civil Defence, and most importantly, the community in Creaselock. Yesterday, Friday the 8th of October, 
at approximately 3.20 p.m. an explosion occurred at a building complex in Creaselock County, Donegal. I can now confirm there are 10 fatalities as a result of that explosion. The emergency services continue a search and recovery operation at the site this afternoon. But based on the information available to Angarda Siakona, at this time it is not expected that there will be any further casualties located and there are no outstanding reports of unaccounted for persons. The 10 casualties are four men, three women, two teenagers, a boy and a girl, and a younger girl. The thoughts of all the emergency service personnel who have attended the scene over the last 24 hours, the local community in Creaselock and the nation are today with the deceased and their families. In respect for the deceased, I now ask for a short, silent pause in their memory. I will now ask Gary Martin, Director of Emergency Services at Dundagall County Council, to provide a briefing on the on ongoing local authority and fire service response. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I want to confirm that Donegal County Council Fire Service mobilised six brigade areas yesterday afternoon to Creaslaw, including 65 fire service personnel. Uh, in addition to that, we deployed 20 Donegal County Council civil defence personnel, a structural engineer, and to facilitate the fending off of the area, road service personnel. Uh, I want to acknowledge the assistance from our colleagues in the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, who attended with specialist equipment, uh, and search dogs. I also want to acknowledge the huge input from the local community who attended in huge numbers from yesterday afternoon uh, in Creaslaw and who contributed so much to our efforts there. Our primary focus yesterday uh, was to lead uh, on the search and recovery uh, of the injured and to stabilise what was a substantially damaged building including many displaced and broken concrete slabs. Over the course of last night, and following uh, a detailed analysis of the site by our crews, uh, aided by search dogs and cameras and listening equipment, the incident moved into a search and recovery phase. We will remain on site uh, in an ongoing search and check phase to ensure that there are no remaining casualties in the building. I'd like to acknowledge the cooperation of everyone involved uh, uh, as we went about our work yesterday and today, and in particular, our major emergency management colleagues and the primary response agencies of the Gardaí and the HSE. Finally, and on behalf of the Council, as members and staff, I want to pass on our sincere condolences to the families and friends of the victims of this terrible tragedy. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Now going to ask JJ McGowan, Chief Ambulance Officer for the Western Region of the National Ambulance Service, to provide a briefing on the National Ambulance Service response to this incident. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> on behalf of the HSE and the National Ambulance Service, I wish to express our deepest sympathies in relation to this terrible tragedy which has unfolded increasingly yesterday. To our staff, including those in the hospital and community health, words cannot describe your efforts. Each and every one of you have gone above and beyond in your response. A special word of thanks also goes to those who have provided medical assistance to us. Uh, these include, but are not limited to, the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service and their heart team and their aeromedical services, the Irish Community Air Ambulance, ground crews, uh, the, the Coast Guard Rescue 118 helicopter and the Letterkenny University Hospital forward surgical team. A special word of thanks also goes to Dr Jerry Lane uh, who assisted on behalf of the Irish Community Air Ambulance. Uh, we will continue our efforts to work with our colleagues in the Gardaí and the fire service until all recovery efforts have concluded. Yesterday we transported eight patients from the scene, one of whom was critical and further transported to a hospital in Dublin. Seven of the patients transported uh, at this time remain in a stable condition. Uh, the National Ambulance Service allocated a total of eight emergency ambulances yesterday, 
and three this morning. We also uh, uh, dispatched two uh, intermediate care or patient transport vehicles, four doctors and four ambulance officers. We currently have two emergency ambulances, uh, two ambulance officers and one doctor on the scene. Uh, our thoughts remain with the bereaved victims, those injured, fellow responders, the community and all those who have contributed to the rescue efforts. From 12 noon today, counselling and further services have been put in place by the HSE at Creasla Community Day Care Centre. Thank you. Thank you, JJ. I'm now going to ask Superintendent David Kelly of Milford Garda Station to provide a briefing on Garda Shea Colonel's response and what the next steps in the investigation of this incident will be. Good afternoon. Uh, if I may say thank you for coming here today. Yesterday afternoon I went to a meeting in Falcara, actually driving by the location where this happened. Little did I think I'd be standing before you here today. This is a tragedy for our community. There's families left devastated. And I suppose I just want to start off by offering, on behalf of myself and my colleagues that attended the scene yesterday and indeed are continuing to do so, our, our very sincere condolences. You've heard from my colleagues from the two other services. Initially the fire service took the lead in this operation and they still do. We assisted them from a Garda perspective in terms of attending the scene, securing the scene, making it a safe place for themselves to work and their personnel and indeed the HSE ambulance personnel. You've heard from my colleagues as well, there was great assistance given throughout, if you like, the, the relevant emergency services in this jurisdiction. We also received great help from our colleagues in Northern Ireland. That's what it is to be in Donegal. We look out for each other. I'd just like to say as well, uh, forgive me if I get a bit emotional because you're dealing with the public, you know. But I would say in terms of what we did, I outlined that we worked with the uh, other services. At this point in time, we have to keep an open mind as a police service and how we investigate this. But at this inf our information at this point in time is pointing towards a tragic accident. That said, being a, a Garda, I have to take a holistic and overall viewpoint. But that's where we're going at the moment. We are working in consultation, as I say, with the coroner. In that regard, we've put family liaison officers in place with the families of the deceased. We're also working with the HSE in terms of the local community as well, in terms of offering, if you like, psychological safety to the families and the wider community in that regard. I suppose in terms of my own colleagues, and I know from my colleagues here with the fire service and the ambulance service, we have to think of the people from our own service that did attend. And again, the, the necessary uh, resources are being put in place in that regard. Uh, I'd just like, to, if you guard a response, as you, as you can imagine, the call comes in. We're directed by our North Regional Western uh, Control Centre, which is based in Galway. Resources were initially deployed from the Milford Garda district here, assisted by members that were off duty. I'm proud to say I didn't have to ask for people to turn out for duty. They came in. We were assisted by members from Letterkenny, uh, Ballyshannon, Bunkrana. Currently, we're working with the Garda National Technical Bureau, and they're giving us assistance. We have specialist units within Donegal. I'm not going to name them. Uh, suffice to say, any resource, like my colleagues have said, that is required, we are putting them in place and we are using them. Uh, I hope I've answered most of your questions. If not, I'm sure Liam and my colleagues can help afterwards. Thank you for your time. We're looking into that. We're looking into that at the moment. We are following certain, if you like, investigative angles. But at this point in time, for operational reasons, I'm not going to go into that, please. I can answer that, but I'll just ask my colleague from... Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we transported eight patients... Sorry. We transported eight patients to hospital yesterday, one of which is in critical condition, and we further transported that by air to a hospital in Dublin uh, yesterday evening uh, to the Burns unit. Um, of the other seven, uh, at this time, we believed they remain in a stable condition and have not life-threatening injuries. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And just uh, on that, the, the, the age group of the, say, the eight injured, you know, what range? We're not going into age groups. Yeah, we're not going into any details. Do we know if there are members of the same family involved? 
again, unfortunately at this time, it's, it's not even 24 hours since this incident happened. As my colleague Superintendent Kelly said, we have family liaison officers dealing with very, very traumatised families at this time, so we're not going into any personal details of the families or the individuals involved just for the moment. Do Thank you. Do know if all the people are local? My understanding is everybody involved are, are local to the, the North Donegal or, or the Creaselock area, yes. We don't have that specific information at this time. Again, the members from our technical bureau are, are, are attending the site. We are able to carry out some investigations, but at the moment the priority still remains the search of the site to ensure there is absolutely no, no other casualties, but we are quite satisfied that not at the moment. But that, that investigation by the technical bureau will go on over the next number of days. Yes, yes, so it will. Over the next number of days, it will be taken. The time will be taken to ensure that this is investigated fully to determine any of the causes of, of, of what has caused this tragic accident. The younger child is a girl. Yes. Aileen, was there another question? Anybody else? Any other questions, Sarah? At this point in time, as Superintendent uh, Kelly has said, all the indications are that it is a tragic accident. However, the investigation will determine the exact nature of the cause. But at this moment in time, it would appear to be a tragic accident. Is there any warning to be given to people on the base for this accident? Is there anything that people should be aware of from a public safety perspective based on this accident? Again, we have to determine the exact cause of the accident before we can start going down the, down, down the route of, of uh, identifying any particular problem. So at the moment, and that will follow as, as, as we identify more issues in relation to this cause of the accident. Is there any My understanding, um, emergency services are on the scene within less than 10 minutes. Can you describe the scene when first responders arrived? Um, unfortunately, I, I wasn't there myself, and I don't think any of my three colleagues were necessarily there themselves. But I know talking both to my own colleagues in the Gary Shikona, and I know JJ and Gary talking to their colleagues, it was a very, very traumatic scene that people came across. It was a very, very confused scene, as, as you can imagine. Um, there was a lot of debris. There was a lot of um, very, very you know, traumatised people you know, already at the scene. So our colleagues definitely will all be provided with their own counselling services by our own agencies to try and deal with what was a, a very, very tragic um, circumstances that they arrived at this time yesterday afternoon. And just on the operation, is there anything similar like this um, in the Florida operation before This is probably one of the largest civilian casualties in, in recent times um, that any of our services have probably dealt with, um, and certainly certainly one of the largest um, civilian casualties in, the, in, in, in this region, um, certainly over recent years or decades. The search and recovery operation is still ongoing to be 100% sure that the search site is clear, but any person that was reported to us as being unaccounted for, we can now account for. But obviously we just need to make sure that there is nobody else out there that we're not aware of. So that search and recovery operation will continue for the next few hours and then it will become a guard on Garish Economy will then take the lead. Um, the investigation will take, take its course over the next few days. Obviously post-mortems will need to be carried out on uh, the bodies of, of all the deceased and working with the coroner and the State Pathologist Service on that, that would take place over the next few days. My understanding is that if 10 fatalities were all fatalities at the scene. And the bodies remain at the scene or have they been removed? All the bodies have been removed at this stage. My understanding is they've all been removed to Letterkenny um, University Hospital at this stage. Can I ask you about the response of the local community, Superintendent? The response of the local community has been um, overwhelming. Um, they were dealing in a situation in their village, in their local people, their neighbours. Um, they turned out in great numbers and gave great assistance to the emergency services. And it, it's, it's remarkable and admirable as to how they reacted. Well, those are the words of the emergency services down in County Donegal in Ireland, where that incredibly sad news conference has just taken place. We've seen fire, police and ambulance expressing thanks for the help they've received and indeed messages of condolence, officers visibly shaken uh, delivering the news that police confirming 10 fatalities in the tight-knit community of Crisla in County Donegal in Ireland. We understand those who have died include four men, three women, 
two teens, we understand a boy and a girl, and one primary age girl as well. The emergency services we just heard were on the scene within 10 minutes, but what looks like an incredible explosion, which police are pointing to as a tragic accident, although they should they would holistically explore every avenue, of course, uh, within the remit of their investigative uh, powers, um, has happened in this tiny village. We understand that Apple Green petrol station, the hub of this village, no more than a mile long, uh, hugging the sides of w both sides of one road, a deli, a post office and a shop there, uh, often filled with many people from the village. The sadness palpable as we see the emergency services there all in attendance and the fire boss taking time to say that in, that aside from his 20 appliances he acknowledged help from the northern ireland emergency services as well who he said attended and came across the border and helped with helicopters and indeed police dogs he underlined as well this is still a recovery operation they are dealing with huge lumps of concrete quite frankly pillars that have come down at that Apple Green petrol station. It is a recovery operation. That means they're hoping to still find more who may be hidden under the rubble. And uh, that news conference just wrapping up there as we confirm to you the death toll in Creasler, in County Donegal, in Ireland, risen now to 10. Four men have lost their lives, three women, two teens, a boy and a girl, and a primary age girl lost their lives. The Irish Prime Minister, Michael Martin, the Taoiseach, saying this is an unspeakable tragedy. And he said the entire nation is shocked at what happened. We can also tell you the local church in Creasler held a mass this morning. Uh, we've seen pictures, certainly on social media, of that being a packed church this morning, remembering those who've lost their lives. And indeed, Father John Joe Duffy is quoted as saying that the community has been hit by a tsunami of grief. Creasler, a community about 30 miles from the border with Northern Ireland, and emergency crews, as I said, crossing from Northern Ireland to help local Garda, fire police and ambulance uh, cope with that extremely distressing incident that's happened. Ten people dead in County Donegal. We'll have more information for you on that, of course, as it comes to us. Thanks, Polly. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Here's what's coming up over this last hour of the show. Households will be paid to put on their washing machines or charge their electric cars away from peak hours as part of efforts to prevent blackouts this winter in a new demand flexibility service. But will enough be done to actually commit us to this scheme? Also, support for the Conservatives has plummeted in Scotland. And to top that off, a new YouGov poll has suggested that support for independence could be on the rise as the gap between yes and no has narrowed to the point where the constitutional question is potentially on a knife's edge, should we believe those polls. And next, we'll be speaking to the defence editor at The Telegraph, Con Coughlin, about how he thinks the reign of Vladimir Putin is coming to a close. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, though, I would love to know your thoughts. The blackouts this winter, are you at home worried about them? Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Watch us on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of crack and content on our page. Cheers very much. As I say, the national grid have warned that British households could lose power for up to three hours at a time this winter if gas supplies run low. I don't know about you, but I'm already shaken at the thought of not being without any broadband. Whilst it, it, say, it says it's a base case, it expects homes will face no problems, it admitted that supply interruptions were a possibility if the energy crisis escalates. The company also revealed that the creation of a demand flexibility service whereby some households are paid to reduce their power usage at peak times. Is that a practical solution to avoid blackouts? Should we welcome this? Well, break, to break this down, I'm joined by the energy commentator, Jamie Delaghi, an energy and infrastructure analyst at the IEA, Andy Mayer. 
Jamie, can I start with you? This sounds like pretty scary stuff, actually, for many of my viewers. The National Grid saying that power cuts could happen this winter. Just how extraordinary is it that we're even discussing this in 2022? Yeah, before I, before I answer that, Darren, can I just uh, extend my condolences to the people of Crishla on the terrible tragedy that's beset the village. A lot of people from Northern Ireland holiday in that area, and we feel very deeply at the consequences of this awful explosion. But yeah, I think to get back to your question, the reality is that this is quite a stark a message that National Grid is sending out. Um, I do think it is very sensible. I would like to see the government nationally uh, underpinning it by encouraging us all to reduce our energy consumption this winter and subsequent winters because we expect this, uh, this crisis in energy prices to continue. But uh, I, I do believe uh, that it really, while it is an interesting initiative and there is evidence from uh, a study which was carried or a trial carried out by national grid and octopus energy earlier this year which showed promising results and that people who were incentivized to cut their electricity consumption at peak times did so and, and by quite a substantial amount i think close to 20 percent at peak evening hours that the the problem with such a thing is or reading it or extrapolating from from an exercise like that is that these are volunteers. Um, they're motivated to do their bit. The, the difficulty comes when you extend it to the wider population and let's say, invite others to do it. Would they be bothered? Would the uh, incentives be enough? It's, it's, uh, I read that it could bring in a household something like 10 pounds plus per day. You know, Would okay. that be enough to get people to shift demand? Yeah, Andy Mayer, I haven't got very long, unfortunately, but I'm wondering, you are a man at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Is this sort of scheme, central planning, the kind of central planning that you know is littered throughout history as not working? Well, this is more like the government's trying to repair the damage it's done with its own energy policy, which is to encourage people to use more energy by reducing the price with various other schemes that then encourage them not to. Although, bizarrely, the issue with the promotion of energy efficiency, they seem to want to spend 100 to 200 billion subsidizing prices, but not 15 million pounds telling people not to, which would have dividends far beyond that. On paying people compensation, it's problematic because the only people who can really adjust their energy in that way tend to be better off. So they are not going to be incentivized by very small payments. And those who would actually benefit frankly, can't afford to do so because they need to work, they need to organise their lives around very fixed schedules. So not, not a great idea at both ends, and it would be better to let this market work properly and help people with benefits. So just to, to bring that to an end, I just want to go to the two of you and ask you both what you think about the calls from some saying, well, actually, this is why we need to go hell for leather on investing in renewables. Andy? Uh, renewables will help in five, seven, 10, 20 years time. And it will help if the government gets out of the way in terms of permitting and planning in the same way they're trying to do with fracking. So we need all forms of energy, but renewables on their own won't do it because they need gas back up at the moment. There aren't affordable storage alternatives. So Jamie, is, are those great big wind turbines, are they what would actually get us out of crises like these? Well, I have to agree that, you know, we this renewables are the solution in the long term, but actually to fix short term problems. No, I don't I don't think uh, that that would be there is sufficient capacity out there to get us through this winter. Uh, should there be a drastic cut in the amount of gas coming into the UK because uh, we heavily rely on gas for power generation. So yes, renewables in the long term, we should be doing, we should be insulating our houses better, et cetera, et cetera. But I really don't know that there's very much we can do apart from what we both agree on our, the, our, our two, uh, two of our, your commentators here, which is that uh, we, we, we should really encourage people to reduce consumption. There should be a campaign. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm not in, um, uh, speaking out of turn here. Absolutely. No, I thank you both for your time. I tell you what, though, I thought that the idea of a, a campaign telling us how to save energy was a little bit patronising, to be honest. I think the, the idea that people don't know that turning off a few lights when you're not using them and things like that are going to save you a few, Bob. Well, 
you know, we're not thick, but there we are. We'll leave it there, folks. Energy commentator Jamie Delaghi and the energy and infrastructure analyst at the IEA, Andy Mayer. I thank you both for your contribution and expertise there. Plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain, though. Next, we'll be discussing Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, and how he has deemed the Northern Ireland Protocol as a little too strict, you don't say. First up, though, let's have a look at the weather. So looking ahead to this evening's weather then and the UK looking mostly fine with clear sunny spells, a few showers though in the northwest. Let's home in. It's going to be a dry start of the evening across the southwest of England, fairly clear skies and uh, no more than a gentle wind blowing. Then high pressure will be in charge of the weather across the southeast, keeping it dry and settled with long clear periods developing. Some patchy cloud drifting in across Wales, but the weather's staying fine there. And some also clear spells at times. And a similar weather setup expected as we head across to the Midlands. And the day ending on a quiet note with a good deal of dry and at times reasonably clear weather all round. Away from the North Pennines, where we could see some cloud, the northeast of England heading into the evening on a fine note as well. A slight southwesterly breeze is expected though. And that breeze, fairly noticeable as we head north towards Scotland, although there will be clear spells in the east. Further west, more in the way of cloud, and showers expected there as well. Northern Ireland could catch a shower or two as well, but mainly towards the north and the west of the province and elsewhere. Although it will be a little breezy, the weather does look fine. So turning chilly across southern and eastern areas overnight under broken cloud. Meanwhile, winds strengthening in the northwest with rain arriving. And that's how the weather's shaping up this Sunday. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. 
And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Let's bring you up to date then with events in Ireland where you may have been tuned to GB News earlier. You may have heard that 10 people have lost their lives and the number of dead is expected to rise after an explosion at a service station there. Those confirmed dead are, we understand, four men, three women, two teenagers, male and female, and one primary age girl. Well, Doogie Beatty has been with us all morning in County Donegal, watching events unfold and finding out more for us. Doogie, what is the latest you have? Well, you'll have heard from that press conference that the, uh, the Garda Shia Khanna are now only starting that investigation to find out exactly what did happen here. They know that the events yesterday happened at 3.15pm. A massive explosion ripped through that shop, killing 10 people. As you've said, four, women, or four men, three women, two teenagers and one child. It is a day that will be never, ever go away from here. Uh, as we suspect that they were all local, local to this area um, and that is a big big blow for any families and communities in and around here. To, to put it in some sort of uh, perspective where this was is Letterkenny is the main popul population of the county of Donegal and then that road travels out from Letterkenny towards a place called Dunfanachy and on that road is lots of little villages along the way. It's a bit like the, the road probably from Shrewsbury into Wales and those villages are linked by one main road. So they all use the same school, the same hospitals they, they play uh, football together and athletics together. They go to the same churches and this day will stick with them forever and ever. I mean, this is such a blow to a very, very tightly knit community. Uh, tomorrow, of course, uh, the flowers will start to be um, laid, no doubt, at the premises where it happened. We've seen some families coming there today. Uh, I think tomorrow we will see a different outlook from people of what actually has uh, occurred. Word from the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, Mikel Martin, as well on this. What did he have to say? Well, he said it was a tragic day for the Republic of Ireland. Miho Martin, of course, will no longer be the Taoiseach after the 14th of December. He is in a coalition government that he has to hand over to Leo Varadka, the head of Fine Gael, uh, in and around there. And this, this is a terrible blow for any Taoiseach to have to have this happen to his people, and especially at the end of a time when um, they are, are looking to leave a mark and leave some sort of rejoicing and leave some sort of um, thought with their people of, of how, how they were treated by a certain type of government. And Miho Martin, I have spoken to him on many occasions. He is a family man. He uh, is, is well involved in politics. He's one of those people that actually got involved in politics because of community. And it really plays out on him when you see him and you talk to him. And, and I think it will have genuinely, they will not be political words. I do believe they will be very, very personal words to him. The pictures we're seeing for those watching on television, Doogie, as you're speaking, of the emergency services in attendance last night. We understand within 10 minutes of the call being made, a huge response from the emergency services and help from across the border. Yes. Um, very much so. Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, there may be many, many things said uh, over the years, but they have always been in response to one another, uh, including with our ambulances, coast guards and so forth. I mean, th there is quite literally a land border. It is the only part of the UK that has that very important land border where there is a difference of um, police forces and ambulance services. Uh, and they have always operated that way. And even their hospitals here, sometimes we, we would be treated in Dublin and sometimes they would be treated in Northern Ireland. The border here is only quite literally about 15 miles away from where I'm standing now, probably about 30 miles away from where that particular incident took place at uh, Chrysla. And uh, it, it, it is testament to how those services work together. Even in storms in Northern Ireland, uh, when the I would report on those storms, you would find that the emergency services and electricity service from the south would go north and vice versa. Interesting to hear the police, wasn't it, Doogie, talking about this as being treated as a tragic accident. What's your thought on that? Well, uh, they also said that that was their 
first thought as the Garda Shikana or a police force that that would always have to be their first thought, but it would be in their back of their mind to look further. It, it may be a tragic accident or it may be that there is something else um, to do with building regulation that will now have to be looked at in and around what happened here. Nobody knows at this minute in time. The whole uh, point of this operation so far has been uh, to, first of all, rescue people and then the recovery of bodies. That, they believe, is now at an end. They believe that anybody that has been uh, missing has now been recovered, although they are still um, treating it very much as a recovery. Doogie, as you say now, that operation turning from a rescue mission to a recovery mission and a community now having to begin that painstaking process of trying to heal from this. We understand there was a mass this morning uh, with Father John Joe Duffy saying the community has been hit by a tsunami of grief. There, there was, and, and it was um, interesting to see that the Bishop of um, Derry as well arriving there. There is uh, quite a large um, community here of, of uh, Church of Ireland, uh, Anglican as well. And um, those, those um, men of God, if you like, are, are here to try and bring comfort to uh, these people in their time of need. And hopefully they will find some. Doogie, we appreciate that as you report to us from Creesloch in County Donegal. Donegal, rather, 10 people confirmed to have died after that huge explosion at a petrol station there in the county. More news on that throughout the day here on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Now, the Republic of Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister has branded the Northern Ireland Protocol as it was originally designed as being too strict. Leo Varadka remarked that the protocol was working despite not being fully implemented and added that there was room for further changes and flexibility. His comments follow the resumption of negotiations between the United Kingdom and the European Union on the protocol and the continuing disruption to Northern Irish trade. We've got that border down the sea between the rest of GB and Northern Ireland. Well, joining me to discuss this is Member of the House of Lords and the former Deputy Leader of the DUP, Nigel Dodds. Nigel, first of all, I'm sure that you'll join me in sending our thoughts and prayers to the people there. It, it, we've seen in Donegal that just absolute terrible tragedy seems to have taken place. Yes, absolutely, Darren. It's a horrendous um, event that has taken place. And, you know, every one of us can relate to calling into a, a, a filling station or wanting to call in and get some groceries or a snack or something. And, and to be caught up in something like this is just horrendous. And when you when you hear those who have died include men, women, teenagers, a young child, it really is awful. Our hearts and prayers are with the bereaved of those who have lost their lives and obviously hope and pray that those that have in, been injured make a swift recovery. But um, it's, it's uh, again, we pay tribute to the wonderful uh, responders from both sides of the border, Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, who are coming together to try to do their very best for people and a community there who, um, as as Dougie Beatty was said there in the report, uh, this this will be something that will be devastating for them for, for generations to come. So our hearts and prayers are, are with the people of Donegal and, and the whole of uh, the Irish Republic today. Absolutely. Now, on Leo Varadka's comments there, where he remarked that the Northern Irish Protocol was working despite not being fully implemented, but actually saying that it's been designed too strictly. What did you make of those comments? Well, it, it would probably qualify as the understatement, not only of the year, but of, uh, of the entire decade, quite frankly. Anyone uh, with any common sense whatsoever knew from the moment it was designed that it was... Uh, not just too strict, but it was unworkable. Um, and uh, Leo Varadkar was the uh, Taoiseach, the Prime Minister at the time. Uh, and, and he knew that at the time, and yet he pers persisted with it and, and urged the EU to rigorously implement it. Remember, it's not that long ago people were talking about 
rigorously implementing it because it isn't being fully implemented at the moment. If it were, we'd be in an even more disastrous position. But I do welcome the fact that uh, Leo Varadkar, who is going to be the Prime Minister come December, uh, coming out with some recognition and acknowledgement of the damage that his policies have done. And I hope that it heralds the beginning of a real and proper negotiation with Brussels and that Dublin will allow those negotiations to proceed, which will del- deliver a proper change to the protocol, not just tweaking it to reduce some checks, but actually fundamentally deals with its flaws, uh, which are driving a wedge between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. And Lord Dodds, the DUP, of course, for my listeners, they are refusing to form an executive in, in Northern Ireland in protest at the protocol. Do you reckon now, what are you saying to your party? Are you saying get round the table now, the EU seem more open to negotiation here? Is now the time to actually form an executive? No, we've just had our party conference today and the party leader, Jeffrey Donaldson, was very, very clear that uh, what we're hearing are words and, and we need to see action. We've been here before, remember, the EU has talked before about recognising the problems and, and wanting negotiations, but when it comes down to it, they don't actually change fundamentally their position. So at the moment, we have a situation in Northern Ireland where laws over vast swathes of our economy are being made in Brussels, not by any elected member of Stormont, uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly, or any MP at Westminster. And no English, Scottish or Welsh representative worth their salt would accept that for their constituents. And we're not prepared to accept that either. So we will wait and see. And whether it's by virtue of the negotiations or by virtue of the protocol bill, which is making its way through Parliament and which is coming to the Lords next week, uh, we will wait and see the, whether those, uh, either by negotiation or legislation, as I say, whether the outcome deals with the fundamental democratic deficit that we suffer in Northern Ireland and removes the REC border. Um, that has to happen. Otherwise, the Belfast Agreement institutions will continue to remain fatally undermined because the Belfast Agreement depends on unionist and nationalist consent, unionist and nationalist. Uh, participation, and the protocol does not have any single unionist representative in support of it in the Assembly. Yeah, so Nigel, basically, what are you saying? I don't want to put words in your mouth at all. You are quite capable forming your own. But Nigel, do you reckon that actually if the protocol stays as it is, if it continues down this path, that actually the Belfast Good Friday Agreement has had its day? Well, I, I think, sadly, that that is correct. That is a, 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 a sound analysis of where we are at in Northern Ireland. The protocol drives a coach and horses through the Belfast Agreement as amended because it, it, it is imposing a, a barrier between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom, which it's not imposing between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. And it's removing unionist consent. No unionist elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly just a number of months ago is in support of it. So if this protocol endures, if it's not got rid of, either by legislation or by negotiation, then I'm afraid the institutions of the Belfast Agreement and the agreement itself will not survive because it depends on unionist and nationalist consent. And so the choice is very much with the UK government. Uh, Some of the things that Liz Truss has been saying has been very, very good. But we now need to see that delivered into action because everyone in Northern Ireland is suffering. The cost of living crisis has been exacerbated by the extra costs being imposed on consumers in Northern Ireland by the extra cost of doing business within the United Kingdom, and that's simply intolerable. All right, we'll leave it there, but very eloquently said, as ever, former Deputy Leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, Lord Nigel Dodds, I thank you for your time. Now, folks, I thank you as well for being with GB News on telly and DAB radio. Next, we're going to head over to Scotland after a new poll has suggested support for Scottish independence is on the rise again. I'll see you after this break.
Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back. A new poll has found that the support for Conservative Party in Scotland has plummeted after the chaos of Liz Truss's mini-budget, with support for the party the lowest it's been for eight years. And Scottish Labour are reaping the benefits of this supposed collapse. In other news, the latest YouGov poll found that support for Scottish independence was going up ever so slightly, with the retention of the union potentially on a knife edge. Well, to give us a lowdown on this, I'm joined by the political editor at the Scottish Daily Mail, Michael Blackley. Michael, thank you very much for your time. Could you just tell where about these latest polls that we're seeing? What are they telling where about both the support for the Conservative Party and for unionism in Scotland? Yes, yeah, so there's been a flurry of new polling in recent days. And I, I think certainly for the Scottish Conservative leader, Douglas Ross, he'll be pretty concerned about some of the the findings. So there was a YouGov poll for the, the Times a few days ago, which showed support for the Conservatives really sliding back to levels not seen in the last eight years in Scotland. So there's been a lot of good work from the Conservatives in Scotland and building up their support. They are now the main opposition. They've overtaken Labour in recent years at that. But what the, this polling shows is that that could potentially change completely. They could really fall back at the next general election they could uh, they could end up with no seats whatsoever so it'll be worrying news uh, for Douglas Ross but of course it's reflecting the position UK wide which is also showing the the conserv conservatives doing pretty badly so i think their their main hope will be that this is that this is polling that's being done in a time of chaos. It, it's a uh, Liz Truss has just come come in. Things haven't gone at all smoothly. Um, however, their main hope will be if she can turn it around and can start to show the kind of growth that she economic growth that she says that these policies she's introduced will lead to. Then perhaps the Scottish Conservatives will have some hope that they'll be protected from the kind of declines in vote share. Um, in terms of the issue of the the union, I mean certainly that that poll for U, the YouGov poll for the Times showed a, an increase in support for for independence, a slight increase, a slight decline in support for the union. But ultimately, I don't think that poll or any of the other polls that have come out recently have really shown that much of a change in the position since the 2014 independence referendum. And indeed, the the issue that will perhaps worry 
Nicola Sturgeon a bit more than the the yes no question is actually the question of whether there should be a referendum at all next year. She wants one in October next year, and some of the polling that's come out shows that only uh, only just over a third of people in Scotland actually agree with her that that should happen next year. And as she opens the SNP conference this weekend, I think that's the that's the issue that will pa- perhaps worry her more than anything else. Yeah, I've just got a minute left with you, but I really do want to ask you about the the reports that Nicola Sturgeon told another broadcaster that it was absurd that she hasn't yet had a phone call from Liz Truss more than a month after she became Prime Minister. I mean, a lot of my viewers will be saying, well, what's the point in Liz Truss calling Nicola Sturgeon and trying to cooperate with her? Because ultimately, right, she's never going to be a, a help to a party that's called the Conservative and Unionist Party. Yes, it is a very difficult balancing issue for any Conservative Prime Minister, how they deal with the First Minister. We heard a lot of rhetoric from Liz Truss during the leadership campaign about how she'd deal with uh, Nicola Sturgeon, about how she'd ignore her, and she actually rolled back from that during the the campaign. And I, I don't think it is the case that Liz Truss will ignore Nicola Sturgeon. I think she will try to work cooperatively with her in issues that she okay. thinks she can work with her on. But I do think that she'll be ignoring any push for an independence referendum. Absolutely. Political editor at the Scottish Daily Mail there, Michael Blackley, I thank you very much for your insight. Now, folks, moving on. This week, Prime Minister Liz Truss attended a meeting of the European political community in Prague. The group, which is the brainchild of French President Emmanuel Macron, compromises of 44 member states and met to discuss a common strategy on Russia's war in Ukraine. With me now to discuss this is the deputy editor at Conservative Home, Henry Hill. Henry, I thank you for your time. This European club, a lot of my viewers are saying, hang on a minute, Liz Truss has just committed the UK to join part of the EU's permanent structured cooperation or PESCO for the military. It sounds a little bit like the aspirations that the European Union have, the club that we voted to leave. Am I being too extreme, Henry? I think I think a little bit. Uh, there's always been a distinction drawn by most Eurosceptics between membership of the European Union, a political union with ambitions to become a federation, and European cooperation. This organisation that Liz Truss was uh, was visiting uh, is much bigger than the European Union. It's far too big to ever have the kind of political ambitions that the European Union has. You mentioned the military. Uh, organization previously. I think, unless I'm much mistaken, countries like Norway and even I think the United States, which aren't members of the EU, are also involved in that organization. So there's always a distinction to be made between, yes, where we've left the European Union and we've left it in quite a hard way and we've left a lot of its economic structures and that's what the British people voted for. But that doesn't mean that we have to wall ourselves off from cooperating with other European states on a case-by-case basis. And I think that the war in Ukraine and energy security is clearly an area where it's good to have as much cooperation as we can achieve. What do you make of the the analysis, your analysis after that event? Do you think actually the, the cohesion that we've seen thus far with European countries who are more dependent on Russian gas than we are here in Britain, do you reckon they'll stay the course, they'll stay steady and keep defending Ukraine's interests? Well, that's why I think it's so important that we do have a show of of leadership with other European countries, so that we can come up with an alternative, because you're right, there are a lot of countries with less fortunate geography than us who are in different ways overshadowed by Russia economically, militarily or otherwise. And if we don't act, then that sort of pull of gravity, if you like, may start dragging them in Putin's direction. So it's vitally important that we are able to say, look, there is an alternative. We have a plan for weaning the continent, not just Britain, not just France, but the continent of Europe off of dependence on Russian gas and securing energy autonomy. And that, I think, taking a proactive approach to that can help keep those countries on the side of the angels. Yes. So what do you say then to those who claimed that we'd ultimately have absolutely no influence post Brexit, right? It strikes me that European leaders are saying, well, actually, I want the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to actually play a part in this organisation and help them move forward. 
Yeah, of course. I think there was there was an, always people on either side of the referendum who grossly over egged the degree um, of separation that was going to end up. You know, we've left a political project. That is a big step. It will take a long time to work out the ramifications of that. But the United Kingdom remains a very important European economy. It remains one of the most important military powers uh, in the Western alliance. Of course, there was always going to be spheres in which we could profitably cooperate with our European partners. And of course, those countries, once the, you know, the referendum was further in the past, would be more willing to admit that. In the referendum campaign, of course, it was in their interest to say that we'd be sealed off behind a sort of wall of mists and never referred to again. But in the real world, in the, in the world where we have common problems, there are always going to be joint solutions, and it's quite right that we work with them to find them. Okie dokie. Deputy Editor at Conservative Home, Henry Hill, I thank you for your insight and analysis on thank that you. latest meeting of European leaders. Now, in his latest piece for The Telegraph, Con Coughlin claims that the end of Vladimir Putin is fast approaching with his forces continuing to suffer defeats on the battlefield and the realistic prospect that Ukraine may capture Crimea, something Kovlin claims could be a dagger blow to the heart of Putin's regime. Well, I'm delighted to say he joins me now, Chief Foreign Affairs Columnist for The Telegraph. Con, could you just tell me why you reckon Putin's end is, is fast approaching here? Because a lot of my viewers will be saying, surely this is pie-in-the-sky stuff. Well, good afternoon, Darren. Um, I, I think the reason why Putin's end is fast approaching is because of his management of the war in Ukraine, which has gone very, very badly. Um, the Russian army no longer wants to fight. They've, they've been decimated in terms of their military strength. Um, and they are looking now at some very significant losses. I mean, it was only last week that Putin held his great um, celebration in Russia to celebrate uh, annexing the four territories of Ukraine. Um, and then, you know, within a few days, he no longer controls large amounts of territory in those territories. So, I mean, it's going very badly for him. And, and as I said in my article earlier in the week, um, the way the Ukrainians are going at the moment it is not beyond the bounds of possibility that they can capture the whole of the Crimean Peninsula, right? You know, which was the start of this trouble in 2014. And that really would be a major setback for Putin. Yeah, because we saw that extraordinary footage, didn't we, this morning of the only bridge between Russia and Crimea actually being blown up. I mean, just how much of a, of a blow, if you pardon the pun, is that to Putin and Russia? Well, it's pretty significant because Crimea is what this is all about, actually. Crimea is where the Tsars used to have spend their summers. Um, from a Russian perspective, this is an integral part of Russia, Mother Russia, uh, which is why Putin was so keen to capture it back in 2014. And historically, of course, it's the, the, the base for the Black Sea fleet. So this bridge, which Putin himself built, and was completed, I think, in about 2018, is now unusable. So this is one of the main, well, it is the main archery from Crimea into Ukraine. Um, and a lot of what Putin's been doing in the last seven months is trying to build you know, a buffer zone in what was Ukraine, as far as he's concerned, so he can control Crimea. Well, you know, this, this is pretty spectacular. And frankly, you know, I've been, I was at a conference earlier this week with some fairly senior military figures who predicted this would happen, that the Ukrainians now have the missile capability to destroy this bridge. And once that bridge is out, is out of action, then Crimea itself becomes isolated. Uh, and a lot of people in Crimea will want to leave. So suddenly, you know, the whole balance of this conflict is turning very much against Putin's favour, uh, yeah. uh, against him. Um, and then it begs the question, can he survive this? And Con, just finally then, is there any suggestion of what it is that's actually caused this extraordinary explosion? Because, you know, the, the Ukrainians have been asking for the capability to actually do this for some time, haven't they? They have. Um, and... 
I mean, w we have to speculate at the moment. The Russians are saying it was just uh, some some uh, fuel explosion, but we know that the Ukrainian special forces have been very effective operating behind Russian lines, and this has, to my mind, um, all the hallmarks of a special forces operation. It doesn't look like a, a missile strike. It looks like somebody's got, got under that bridge, planted some explosives, and detonated them. But right, I say well, we're speculating, so I exactly. don't want to make myself up to the fortune. No, indeed not. But we'll have to leave it there. But I thank you for your fascinating insight and, and actually playing the role of my mystic Meg there, my foreign affairs mystic Meg. <laughs> Con Coughlin, thank you very much thank for your you. time. Now, folks, you have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. I thank you very much. This show's on every Saturday at two o'clock. But for now, here's the weather. So looking ahead to this evening's weather then and the UK looking mostly fine with clear sunny spells, a few showers though in the northwest. Let's home in. It's going to be a dry start of the evening across the southwest of England, fairly clear skies and uh, no more than a gentle wind blowing. Then high pressure will be in charge of the weather across the southeast, keeping it dry and settled with long clear periods developing. Some patchy cloud drifting in across Wales, but the weather's staying fine there. And some also clear spells at times. And a similar weather setup expected as we head across to the Midlands. And the day ending on a quiet note with a good deal of dry and at times reasonably clear weather all round. Away from the North Pennines, where we could see some cloud, the northeast of England heading into the evening on a fine note as well. A slight southwesterly breeze is expected though. And that breeze, fairly noticeable as we head north towards Scotland, although there will be clear spells in the east. Further west, more in the way of cloud, and showers expected there as well. Northern Ireland could catch a shower or two as well, but mainly towards the north and the west of the province and elsewhere. Although it will be a little breezy, the weather does look fine. So turning chilly across southern and eastern areas overnight under broken cloud. Meanwhile, winds strengthening in the northwest with rain arriving. And that's how the weather's shaping up this Sunday. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to GB News. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. 
And for the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics that are hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course, it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today is broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy and GB News presenter Reverend, oh, it's father now, Father Calvin Robinson. Is it a reverend or father? Either or. Either or, mean? either or. Right, so before we get started, let's get your latest news headlines. Good afternoon. It's coming up to one minute past four. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB newsroom. Ten people have died, including a primary schoolgirl, in an explosion at a service station in Ireland. Four men, three women and two teenagers have also died. It's understood the petrol station was the hub of the village in a tight-knit community. Northern Ireland's fire and rescue service, who crossed the border to assist with the search and rescue efforts, left the scene a short while ago. The operations now understood to have changed to a recovery mission, with emergency services already having worked right through the night. Well, Irish police believe the explosion was an accident, but aren't ruling out other causes. At this point in time, we have to keep an open mind as a police service and how we investigate this. But at this inf our information at this point in time is pointing towards a tragic accident. That said, being a, a Garda, I have to take a holistic and overall viewpoint. But that's where we're going at the moment. Member of the House of Lords and former Deputy Leader of the DUP, Lord Nigel Dodds, has called the incident horrendous. Every one of us can relate to calling into a, a, a filling station or wanting to call in and get some groceries or a snack or something and, and to be caught up in something like this is just horrendous. And when you when you hear those who have died include men, women, teenagers, a young child, it really is awful. Our hearts and prayers are with the bereaved of those who have lost their lives and obviously hope and pray that those that have in, been injured make a swift recovery. In other news, the serial killer Peter Tobin has died after becoming unwell in prison. It's understood he was taken from HMP Edinburgh to hospital earlier this week. He was serving a life sentence for raping and murdering Polish student Angelika Kluck. He was also serving two life sentences for the murder of 15-year-old schoolgirl Vicky Hamilton and 18-year-old Dinah McNichol in 1991. Their bodies were found 17 years later, buried in the garden of his former home in Margate in Kent. The UK has exported lamb to the United States for the first time since 1989. Prime Minister Liz Truss has hailed the move a milestone after President Joe Biden lifted his country's decades-old ban on imports of British meat in September last year. The market is worth an estimated £37 million in the first five years of trade. Celebrating the news on Twitter, Ms Truss said the move marks a well-deserved boost to our rural economy. Only one, around one in five trains are expected to run today across Scotland, England and Wales. Members of the RMT union are staging their eighth strike this year in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The train operator's chief negotiator, Tim Shoveler, says passengers should only travel by train if absolutely necessary. RMT's General Secretary Mick Lynch has warned of further strikes to come. A large explosion has seriously damaged the only road and rail bridge linking the occupied Crimean Peninsula and Russia. Footage widely shared online shows an explosion on the Kerch Bridge, believed to have been taken to have taken place early this morning. According to Russian authorities, three people have died in the blast. Russian state media claims train journeys will restart later today. An advisor to Ukraine's president described the incident as the beginning but didn't directly claim Ukrainian responsibility. Thousands of people have formed a human chain around Parliament, calling for the release of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Mr Assange is currently being held in Belmarsh Prison in London amid a legal battle to avoid extradition to the US. He's wanted in America over the leak of secret military information. Former PR advisor Richard Hillgrove says it's important for journalism that Assange is freed. The fact that this is being led not so much from don't extradite Assange again, um, but the National Union of Journalists and the International Federation of Journalists, which has 600,000 members, 
globally. Uh, leading this exercise means, you know, the penny is dropping that this is not, a, you know, this is political. This this puts journalism in the firing line. Um, if Assange goes down, journalism goes down. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Nana Akwea.